Kyoto, welcome to all alumni and friends of the University of Auckland to this, the third in our series of Mind Expanding Talks, Raising the Bar Auckland, Home Edition. My name is Mark Bentley. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Development, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's, or today's talk. Uh, for the last three years, we've been raising the bar on one excellent night a year by bringing 20 of our most thought-provoking academics into your favorite Auckland bars to give interesting talks. As COVID-19 has uh, made our bar hopping exploits a tad unwise, this year we've brought everything online. Our motto, we bring the experts, you bring the drinks. So tonight's speaker is one of our engineering superstars, Professor Olaf Deagle. As a global expert in 3D printing, I can guarantee that his lockdown was more productive than mine. In fact, with what Olaf's going to teach you tonight, you may never want to leave the house again. So let's get the show on the road with me handing over to your MC for the evening, Professor Rosalind Archer, who is Deputy Dean of Engineering and also Director of the Geothermal Institute. Now, Rosalind's job will be to introduce Olaf more fully, but also to help you to pose your questions later on. Now, I'm gonna give you two interesting facts on uh, Rosalind. Firstly, she was born during an earthquake and now works professionally developing computational tools to understand heat and fluid flow in the earth. And secondly, she's been a taxpayer in five separate countries. So please be nice to her. We want to hang on to her. Over to you, Rosalind. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Mark, for the generous introduction. I am delighted to MC the third edition of Raising the Bar Home Edition. It really is our pleasure to bring a little bit of the University of Auckland from our home to wherever you find yourself in the world right now. So I'm here to introduce Olaf, who was born in New Zealand, but spent much of his life in other countries, such as the US, Canada, South Africa, and Japan. So I suspect he has as many taxpayer numbers as I do. Olaf is an educator and a practitioner of product development. The Faculty of Engineering at the University of Auckland were thrilled to have Olaf join our staff in 2019. So just a little housekeeping to get us started. The Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on Zoom is live, so please submit any questions you have for Olaf there. We'll be monitoring those as you go through the session. You'll be able to upvote any questions that are asked, and those questions will move toward the top of the Q&A screen. And then toward the end of today's webinar, Olaf will answer some of the highest rating questions. So with that, I'd like to open the floor and let Olaf tell us more about 3D printing the future. Thank you, good morning everybody and thanks a lot Rosalind and Mark for the introduction. My name is Olaf and it really is a pleasure to be with uh, all of you people this morning. And as always, the first challenge is gonna be to share my screen so you can see what I'm seeing. There we go, and all going well, you will now be able to see my PowerPoint presentation, fantastic. Um, so let's get started. So yeah, my name is Olaf Deagle and I work at the um, Creative Design and Additive Manufacturing Lab at the University of Auckland, which is a bit of a mouthful in itself. So I thought one slide to show you guys what the lab is about. I describe it, I guess, as a playground to experience additive manufacturing or 3D printing. So additive manufacturing, 3D printing, I use the terms interchangeably, they're both the same thing. So this is an open access lab at the University of Auckland that is trying to get companies and people to use 3D printing for the right reasons in the, in the right way. And an open invitation to anybody who's listening, you're welcome to come and visit the lab anytime that's convenient to come and experience it firsthand and find out a little bit more about what we do. So maybe just to get started, I think almost it's become almost commonplace, but everybody knows what 3D printing is about. But maybe just one slide, I guess the old fashioned way of making almost anything was called subtractive manufacturing, where if I wanna make a bust of my head, I start with a block of stone and I chip away, I cut away the stone until I'm left with the head. And of course that produces a lot of waste material that you then have to either recycle or throw away. And that is still the way 99% of things are made today, either directly, but on a CNC machine, not by hand, or indirectly where you're injecting plastic into a mold or casting metal into a die, the mold or the die are still made the same way. 3D printing works the opposite way around. You start with a virtual computer model, send it to the machine, which slices it up into very, very thin slices, and then prints layer upon layer upon layer to make your model. So one of the big advantages is it, costs, it makes relatively little waste material. It does make some, which we'll talk about a little bit later. 
but maybe the best way to visualize what 3D printing is about, you know, these are all forms of additive manufacturing. So the way architects make terrain maps of their, um, uh, the, the land around them by cutting up slices of wood or cardboard and stacking them, all additive manufacturing because we're building layer upon layer upon layer. Of course, what I'm talking about this morning are high-tech machines that do this for you automatically out of metal, out of polymers, out of ceramics, a variety of different materials. Um, what's interesting is additive manufacturing is not new. It's well over 30 years old now. Um, but it's only in the last sort of 10, 15 years that some of the technologies have gotten good enough to use for production rather than prototyping. For most of its career, 3D printing was a rapid prototyping technology. And there's been a huge amount of hype over the last decade or so. And the reason for the hype is actually relatively straightforward. It's the growth. The growth in 3D printing in the last decade has been you know, 20 to 30% year on year, and there's no real sign of it slowing down. And there's not many industries that are growing that fast. Having said that, there's not many small to medium enterprises today in New Zealand or anywhere in the world where you can walk in and see them using 3D printing for production. For prototyping, absolutely. For production, largely it's the big boys that are driving it. But now that's starting to change. And I think one of the problems with it is that People think I can just design a part for plastic or casting or what have you and print it instead. They think it's a direct replacement technology. And really one of the key takeaways today is that it's not. So in my opinion, I don't think 3D printing will ever replace conventional manufacturing. It's a conventional, it's a complementary technology. So if you use it for the right reasons, it can add huge value to what you're doing. And if you're not adding value to the product that you're building by tape, by using additive manufacturing for the right reason, it can be a slow and expensive technology. So one of the first, I guess, big advantage of 3D printing over conventional is complexity. The more complex your part is geometrically, the better suited it is to additive manufacturing. So here on the screen, you've got two guitars. The one on the right is a Fender Telecaster. Yes, I could technically 3D print it, but it will be a stupid part to print because it's just so geometrically simple. There's just better ways of making it using by hand on a CNC machine. There's a hundred other ways to make it better. The one on the left printed in aluminium, that would be impossible to make any other way. So now you're adding value, in this case, from an aesthetic point of view. And just two slides on aesthetic uh, examples where they're using that complexity to add value. The art and design world is going crazy over 3D printing, making incredibly geometrically complex shape that will be hard or impossible to make any other way. So this is one of those areas. And then one more example from the real world. And these are things, all of the things you see on screen, there are things you can buy today. But one that I really like is from American Standard, an American company that make tapware for your bathroom, your kitchen. So this is art for your bathroom. And the one I love in particular is the one on the right. And you think, well, how does the water get from the top, the bottom to the top? And that's because with 3D printing, you can print these impossible twisting pipes that would be impossible to make any other way. So I guess that's on the aesthetic side, which is fantastic. It's great. It's beautiful. But does it really add value to your life? Well, I say absolutely yes. Some say maybe not. So maybe on the engineering side of complexity, um, light weighting, making products that are lighter. So this is a little titanium bottle opener I have on my key ring. Um, and it uses something called topology optimization. So it's, it's basically software. It uses mathematics to analyze your part and remove the material that's not doing anything useful from an engineering point of view. And you'll find most engineering parts, you'll find somewhere between 30 to 80% of the material may be doing nothing useful. So as an example, in the case of this bottle opener, if you were gonna make it the traditional way, you'd start with a block of material. So if it was say aluminum, it might weigh 10 grams or thereabouts. You bolt it onto your CNC machine and you'd cut away what you see in the middle bottom there, which you've seen similar bottle openers at a lot of widget shops, and that weighs around four grams. In contrast, the topology optimized one down to under a gram. So that's a 90% saving, weight saving on the raw material you started to use. Now start to think about the implications of that. If you have to ship your product around the world, the cost savings on that, the fuel savings on that. So all around, you know, weight saving is a huge ex uh, advantage. And I thought I'd give you one real world example that I was involved with a few uh, years ago when I was in Sweden. So this was with Atlas Copco. So this is an underground drilling rig. So it's one of these giant tractor machines that goes underground in mines. And on the far right, there's a boom arm that extends out and there's a drill on the end of that. 
So within that whole system, there's a really, really boring engineering component called a hydraulic manifold, which is basically, it's a block of steel. So what you're seeing there is a block of steel with a whole bunch of holes drilled into it from different directions. Some of the holes are then blocked and that forms a channel of interconnecting pipes to get hydraulic fluid from one place to another. So this is a very, very heavy component. And because it's on the front, on the end of a boom arm that extends out, any weight saving there, you save threefold on counterweight on the back of the tractor. So this is an example of something that we then redesigned into a lightweight hydraulic manifold going from basically 16.2 kilos to 1.4 kilos. So over 90% weight saving. I mean, that is huge. Now, the component can be made in stainless steel or in aluminum. And here you've got some pictures of it as it comes out of the printer. So on the left is as it came out of our printer and it's still welded to a base plate. So with metal printing, it's a welding process. So it's welded to a base plate. Then you cut it off the base plate and you see it on the right there ready to bolt into the tractor. And it's printed as you see it there and used as you see it there with the threads printed. And um, they don't even need to be chased with the dye or cleaned up afterwards, they're used as is. So complexity, absolute big area of advantage. The next big area of advantage is what we call mass customization. So mass customization means we're mass manufacturing products for everybody, but each product is custom made for you, the user. And that is a growing area. And my prediction is in the next five or 10 years, when we buy a high end product, we're gonna expect for it to be customized. So, Anything medical, of course, benefits from being customized because all our bodies are different. And you can see on the screen the hearing aids, where I think about 96% of inner ear hearing aids are 3D printed. Dental aligners, which is the new way of lining up your teeth from uh, Invisalign originally, but now Smile Direct or advertising on New Zealand TV, examples of that. But I thought I'd give you one really, really cool example, probably one of the best mass customization examples I've come across recently related to COVID-19. So one of the COVID problems was everybody's wearing face masks, but the face masks are generally very poor fitting. There's gaps everywhere for the bacteria and the germ to get in. So a company called Bellis 3D came up with a little mobile phone app where on your iPhone, you hold your iPhone in front of you, you turn your face to the left, turn your face to the right, and literally in about 10 seconds, it generates a 3D scan of your face, which is what you see there. And then on the bottom right of the screen, you see a little uh, button there called uh, mask filter. You press that button and literally within another 10 seconds, it creates for you a custom made, it's a seal. It's just a simple frame that seals your mask onto your face and closes all the gaps around it. And you can print it with your name on it. So we've been printing a whole heap of these. And this is a free app you can download. But as an example of mask customization, I thought this was fantastic because it really demonstrates the principles beautifully. So then the next, to my mind, big, well, I, I call it an engineering advantage, but maybe it isn't. The, the ability to test ideas very, very easily and very, very quickly. To my mind, in, uh, manufacturing actually is a barrier to, 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 to innovation because manufacturing is so hard that if you have an idea, you then go to a company and say, I want to test this idea and they cost you, it's going to cost you $10,000 or $50,000. Well, so that kills the idea. And the other point with that is, let's say everybody listening today has an idea. Well, there's a good chance that 80% of those ideas are not such good ideas. But how do you know? How do you know unless you can actually realize them, test them, give them to people to try? And this is one thing that 3D printing does. It allows you to instantly realize your ideas, to test, to see if it's a good idea or if it's a crazy idea. And to my mind, that's why it's a great catalyst for innovation. So just a couple of examples of that. This was Jenna, one of my students back when I was at AUT who's a mountain biker who runs around the world doing crazy things on mountain bike. And as a third year design project. So when she travels, she's got a big box with a bike in it and it's very hard for her to get around the airport. So she said, oh no, I've got a great idea. I'll print a little set of clip on wheels that you can clip onto any cardboard box just to make it easier to get around. Now the wheels, you can go to Bunnings and buy them for next to nothing. So there's no point printing those, but the clips themselves, are printed and made in a way that they can be nested together. Volume with 3D printing, the bigger the volume, the, the, the higher your cost goes up exponentially. So when you design for 3D printing, you always design things to be as compact as possible. And she did a great job on, uh, on that. So really, really nice example. And the point here is to realize her idea. She didn't have to go to her dad to say, please, can I have some money to try this? Or to the bank to say, please, can I have a loan? And that's one of the big advantages of 3D printing. 
Um, the next example is another COVID-related uh, example. So it's something we did over lockdown, I think, when we were still in level uh, three or four. Um, it's, I've got a little video clip on the next slide. I'll try not to talk during it in case it breaks apart. Um, all going well. So this is a little, I'll just stop the video so it doesn't interrupt the voice. And so it's a, there we go. So this is a little emergency ventilator. So this is not intended as a high-end replacement for $50,000 ventilators. It's intended to replace the hand of a valuable person like a doctor or a nurse who would otherwise be massaging an ambu bag, which is, you know, it keeps the person alive, but the people are much more valuable than that. So this is something that replaces a hand and allows somebody to be kept alive. And we're right now building the second unit. So this first version, we went through three iterations to a final working prototype in less than two weeks. And right now we're building the second version of this, which is gonna go down to Nelson DHB for travel. So one of the areas of interest, for example, is in hospitals to bring, to move a person from one end of a hospital to another, or maybe in an ambulance to transport a patient where otherwise you'd have, again, a valuable person who could be taking better per the care of the person and instead of massaging the ambu bag, you have a machine doing it for them. Um, so as I said, really nice example of rapid product development that 3D printing allows you to do. Um, the next example is a personal one and it's, it's uh, you know, I guess to say something critical about Apple products. This is specifically aimed at the iPad. There's a, there's a design flaw in the iPad. So I've got an iPhone here and the design flaws on the iPad, the speakers are on the back of the iPad which means the sound is actually going the wrong way. So the sound is actually quite bassy. Um, particularly if you listen to music, it's normally bouncing around, it's not too bad, but this, if you listen to voice, the sound is actually really, really bassy. And a very simple way to test that, next time you have your iPad, just cup your hand over the speaker, which re redirects the sound towards the front, and suddenly you get crystal clear sound. I mean, the difference is actually stunning. Um, in my case, it was a political reason. I'm lying in bed watching a zombie movie, and of course, the sound was going straight towards my wife. So there were political reasons why I had to solve the problem. So I did a very, very simple little clip-on speaker, it's just a little widget that slides onto your iPad, and all it does is it redirects the sound towards the front in suddenly crystal clear sound. So 3D printers you can now buy for $500 to $2,000. I strongly believe that anybody with an interest in design and engineering should have one of these at home. So when you find a problem, you can try out a couple of different solutions until you find one that works and you're good to go. Of course, now I've got the iPad Pro with four speakers, so I've had to put it on steroids to go quadraphonic, but it also protects my iPad at the same time if I drop it at the same time. Um, the next example is a crazy one from, it's, I'm not suggesting this is a good business idea, but purely from a creativity point of view, is probably one of the nicest examples I've come across. And it's the concept of funerary sculptures. So the idea is when you die and if you're cremated, instead of keeping you in an urn on the mantelpiece, you get printed into a work of art. As I said, I'm not suggesting this is a good business idea, but just purely from a creativity point of view, I think this is absolutely fantastic. And then I guess one more idea of being able to take products to market with no cost, no initial you know, setup charges is my own personal example of 3D printed guitars. So it's a hobby I have, I make 3D printed guitars. And I started back in 2011 when somebody printed a violin and I saw this story and I said, oh, that's fantastic, could I make a guitar? And I printed the first one and it was fantastic. It played well, it sounded well. So I started a blog about it and started to get response from musicians around the world saying, we've never seen anything quite like that. Can we buy some? So I said, well, what do I do now? And I sold one, I sold another. So I've done 83 today. In fact, I'm building number 84, 85 and 86 right now. Um, and I've got about one of each in my collection. So the other 70 or so have been sold. And again, just some, some examples of them and all purposefully geometrically complex shapes because otherwise there'd be little value to be added in it in terms of making a guitar. But it made sense, I was making guitars, I was making basses, so it made sense to also make the rest of the bands. I've done about three or four printed drum kits, I've done a couple of keyboards, and I've done one saxophone which doesn't quite work yet, but I've got to find the time to do a second iteration of it. It leaks air, and on a saxophone, if you leak air anywhere, it's sort of, I managed to get eight, six or seven notes out of it, but it was hard work. And just to show you an example of one of the guitars, the, the one you see poking out down to the left of the saxophone, the steampunk, and again with a video, I'll try not to talk over it.
So again, because you can. Now, just to hurt your brains a little bit, that guitar with all the gears, the pistons, the whole body is printed in one piece. No assembly required. It comes out of the machine already assembled. It's a powder-based process where a laser melts the powder where it needs to, which is the same process used for metal printing. At the end, you dig it out of the powder. You basically play archaeologist, blow the powder out from the inside, and you're left with a part with moving parts like that. So as I said, that ability to very, very quickly realize ideas is, to my mind, a huge catalyst for innovation. And I think New Zealand could make tremendous advantage of that as a way of growing business. But I think another area that maybe is of huge benefit to New Zealand, and again, we saw that during COVID, is the effect on the supply chain. So the supply chain is how products get from us to where they're supposed to be going. And this is the supply chain before the industrial, industrial revolution, where if I was a maker of chairs, well, I was the supply chain. Maybe the blacksmith, I'd do some bartering, trade some eggs for some nails, and then my chairs I would sell to you guys as the village, and the village on the other side of the hill, probably too far away. So that was a very, very small supply chain. You compare that to the supply chain of today, where I'm the customer on the end, I want my chair, so I'll, I'll drive to Target Furniture. They get it shipped in from Tauranga, who get it shipped in from Guangzhou in China, wherever it is. That supply chain is incredibly complex and incredibly expensive. So a typical consumer product, less than 10% of the cost of the product is the product. The other 90% is that supply chain. It's every one of the middlemen taking their cut. The transport, it is huge. So imagine in the future being able to go back to something closer to before the Industrial Revolution, where now Target, as an example, has 3D printers in store. I go there with my memory stick with my chair that either I've designed myself or I've just downloaded from a famous designer. Please, sir, can you print my chair? Come back half an hour later and my chair is done. Now, don't misunderstand me. The technology is not quite there yet for that but it's coming along very quickly. And one of the big areas of interest around the world is making spare parts. So manufacturing where needed, when needed, so you don't have to ship products around the world and the distribution becomes a lot easier. And looking at spare parts, I've just got one slide with a lot of words on it. Don't worry too much about the words. It's more the numbers that are important. So right now, just in the automotive industry alone, there's around $750 billion of spare parts sitting in warehouses doing nothing useful at all. They're just sitting there waiting for customers to hopefully buy them. A lot of manufacturers say up to 70% of parts end up getting scrapped. So Tetra Pak, we used to do a lot of work with them in Sweden. They've got 800,000 unique spare parts sitting in warehouses in Sweden. And they say they legally have to keep them for 20 years, but they say 60 to 70% of those will get scrapped at the end of 20 years. Some of those parts get shipped in day in, day out. Um, others never get ordered, but they have to have them. Now, just imagine what it would mean being able to free up all that capital to be used to do useful stuff, rather than having sitting on the shelves, rotting away, doing nothing. So again, that is a big area of potential for additive manufacturing. Companies all around the world, Volkswagen already starting to make spare parts. Everybody has a big interest in this. And of course, in COVID, again, as an example of supply chain and distribution, one of the problems with a lot of the PPE was actually to do with, not, not with availability of PPE, but with distribution of PPE to get it to the people that need it when they need it. So around the world, we saw a huge effort in, for example, making face shields. So in New Zealand, there was a, an, an, an organization called Shields Up, but there's similar organizations all around the world. And effectively, it's nerds and geeks in the garages with 3D printers making face shields that they can deliver locally to their local doctor, their dentist, their hospital as needed, rather than trying to ship them around the country and even figure out who needs them, where they need them. So we did a lot of work uh, of PPE stuff in the initial days of um, PPE. The one, you, the one you see on the left there is one we, uh, we did with Canterbury University. It can be made, it's laser cut, it can be made in 30 seconds. And then there's another laser cut one in the minute. And the one on the right is one that can be sterilized. So it's 3D printed on, on our machine. And nothing clever about the design other than that it's foldable, again, to get the smallest possible volume, which means in, an, in about a six, eight hour build, an overnight build, we can print, it, print about 128 sets of these at once. So that ability to very, very quickly get products where they're needed, when they're needed is huge. So 
So far, I've been talking a lot about how wonderful 3D printing is. And don't misunderstand me, it is fantastic. It's a wonderful technology. But don't misunderstand me. It's not necessarily an easy technology that removes all the barriers completely. And one of the big myths in 3D printing is you think, well, you just hit print and you get these beautiful iPhone quality parts coming off the printer. Unfortunately, today it's not. There's a lot of what we call post-processing. So that's the work you've got to do after the product comes off the printer to get it ready to send to the customer. And that can be a huge amount of work. So support material is one of the things we talk a lot about. Uh, and I'll show you a slide on the next slide, but even just painting. So all of my guitars, for example, most of them are printed in nylon, which is a really strong plastic, but they have to be painted afterwards. That's post-processing, that's cost. So I've got a slide here. So this is the aluminum guitar, uh, printed in aluminum. This is it still welded to the build platform. So it's a welding process. And when you weld to stop things distorting because of the thermal stresses in the part, you have to clamp them down. So in this case, it's welded to a platform to stop it distorting. And this particular design is sort of barbed wire with roses inside of it. And just to show you a bit of a close up, um, this what you're seeing there is the top and the bottom barbed wire with support material, which is sacrificial material that gets broken off afterwards. So when I showed you the earlier side chain 3D printing saying, you know, subtractive manufacturing has a lot of material to recycle. 3D printing also has some, it's nowhere near as much. And with good design, it's completely minimal. So the manifold I showed you earlier was great because there was no support material needed other than the tiny bit to weld it to the platform. This guitar being an artistic piece was a bit of a nightmare. And you can see even in the flower, you can see it's a support material. So the final product, if I may say so myself, is rather fabulous. Um, it's a really, really nice guitar to play as well. It looks really good. Now the print time on this, nine hours, is not actually too bad. It's a fairly big guitar printed in aluminum. But look at the support material remove, removal. The first one took me four days to remove the support material. My hands were literally bleeding by the end of it. And this is because you, don't, you, know, you gotta figure out the best technique, the best tools for removing the support material, um, in, of course, without damaging the product itself. And then another four days of sanding, filing to give it a beautiful surface finish. The surface finish coming straight off a metal printer is roughly similar to a sand cast part, which are not the smoothest surface finish in the world. So to get them smooth, you've got to do a little bit of after uh, work. Now the second one, I built two of these. The second one took me two days and two days. But that's still four days of expensive professor level labor to do something that is, you know, there's possibly better ways of spending your time. And to my mind, this is the key to what we do in our lab is design for additive manufacturing. So we figure out the best techniques to design the right way to minimize, for example, this post-processing, to minimize heat treatment of the part after it's done and so on. So really, I mean, we do all sorts of areas of, of additive manufacturing. So right now we've got a food printer that just yesterday we produced our first 3D printed sugar parts. And we, next week we'll have some uh, chocolate going on to it so we can print chocolate. But you know, what's really missing from additive manufacturing? As I said, it's a fantastic technology but we need today more materials. So right now we have about a dozen different metals and a dozen different plastics to choose from, a few ceramics, but nowhere near enough. We bigger, need a bigger selection. We're starting to see biomaterials and bioprinting coming of age as well. Um, unquestionably, one of the biggest weaknesses of 3D printing today is surface finish. So down the bottom, you see sort of a swatch of different surfaces finish. Now we're certainly in the right-hand side of that swatch where the surface finishes are pretty rough. I mean, they're not the smooth, smoothest thing in the world. We need to be in the left-hand side of that swatch. And when we get to that level, we will absolutely be, you know, vastly Im uh, improve the number of people using 3D printing in a big way. And then, of course, the other one is certification. Being able to make parts that you can guarantee that if you put them on an airplane or in a car, they will not break. Mm -hmm. 3D printing is good, in my opinion, it's better than a lot of conventional manufacturing process if you've designed for it the right way, but that's still not the same. Being better is not the same as being certified. Being certified means you need to be able to guarantee consistency that every time you make the part, it will be the same. Unquestionably, we need more better design tools. So I talked to you guys about topology optimization, one of the techniques we use, and there is a lot of software for that but it's not ideal and it's not integrated into our other design system. So we design everything in CAD, we then have to take that into a separate software system to do the topology optimization, then often back into CAD. 
So it's not ideal yet, but it is changing. And it, now there are some companies starting to integrate it into their CAD. And over the next few years, we're going to start to see more and more of that. And of course, the final one is we need to update our engineering and our design programs to actually include design for additive manufacturing right from the start. So our engineering students now, they learn a bit about additive manufacturing, but mostly they focus on conventional manufacturing, which is injection molding, extrusion, casting, and so on. Nothing wrong with that because those will continue to go. But as additive manufacturing grows, we really need people to know how to design for it coming out of school. I mean, I guess one of the challenges with additive manufacturing is if you don't design for it, it is basically a very slow and very expensive manufacturing technology. If you design for it, you can reduce your times and your costs by over 90% for a well-designed part compared to a badly designed part. And that's a lot of what we specialize in in the lab is how to design the right way for it to offer really maximum value you can to your products. So I guess, I mean, that's really it from me in terms of what I'm going to talk about in terms of slide, other than to repeat, I mean, the invitation is open to everybody who's, anybody who's listening. Uh, the lab is based on the New Market campus at the University of Auckland. So feel free to swing by. It's an open access lab. We have a good display space with lots of parts on display. The machines are running almost every day. But if you tell us ahead of time, we can make sure the machines are running. Because once you see the machines in action, they're actually relatively easy processes to understand how they work. When, when somebody's never seen them, it's a bit hard to understand how they work. When you see them, you say, oh, now I get it. And then you start to see the possibilities of what you could do with it. And that's what's important is, you know, the possibilities of what it can do. So I think I'll leave it there. And Rosalind, back to you if there's any thoughts you have or, yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I've just got a few questions and comments for you. And I, I see questions coming in from the audience as well. Um, you've mentioned that you can 3D print in various materials. So, you know, what, that maybe tell us a bit more about the yeah. range of materials that can be 3D printed. You sort of alluded to the fact uh, 3D printing could be um, part of food manufacture potentially. Yeah. So very broadly, there's three main, I guess, techniques. There's one with solid material where plastics in a solid form, so typically a filament, they're extruded. So think of it as a hot glue gun and you take the slice and you draw it with a hot glue gun. And in that, you've got a whole variety of different polymers you can extrude. The next technique, a range of techniques uses a liquid material where plastic, it's a liquid filled, so it's a photopolymer in resin form. And again, you spread a layer of that resin or you inkjet print it and then UV light or a UV laser is used to solidify it. And the final one is powder form, which is the one that's most used for production, where it's metal in powder form. And metal can be titanium, stainless steel, gold, nickel, inconel, platinum, all sorts of metals. And then a laser or an electron beam draws on the powder, melts it wherever you need to it. Or you can have a binder where you print a glue onto the material to bind it together. Now with food printing, that's what we're doing. So we've got powdered food, so any food in powdered format. So right now we're using sugar, but next week it'll be, um, so one of the projects we got on that will be to do 3D printed meat. So we use dehydrated powdered meat, <laughs> I know it sounds strange, spread the powdered meat, then print the binder onto it to bind it together. We can print color onto it. We can print vitamin A or C or whatever makes it good and tasty and then reconstitute meat from basically waste products. Um, there's also techniques using you know, biomaterials. So it's effectively your stem cells in a hydrogel where you can print tissues and organs from um, your own stem cells and they grow into what they're supposed to grow into. That's still relatively new. It is happening all around the world. So as I said, in polymers, we've got about you know, a dozen different polymers to choose from. But if you look at a car, for example, in a car, there's something like between 40 and 60 different flavors of plastic used. Mm. Need 40 different flavors of plastic? I don't think. I think it's for historical reasons largely. But nevertheless, today, they expect to see those same 40 flavors of plastics in a 3D printer, and we're not, we're not quite there yet. Well, I mean, it's, it's a fascinating range of materials. I, I'd never heard of 3D printing of, of meat. Uh, my, my vegetarian ways are finding that a little uncomfortable, but... Uh, well, you could replace it with any protein powder. It doesn't have... This is actually for the, the, the waste of the meat industry. But yeah, absolutely. You could do the same thing with vegetable-based protein, for sure. <laughs> 
<laughs> indeed and, and anything that takes waste and turns it into into useful product that that does resonate really really well with me um so what are your what are your favorite materials to print in well right now i mean for us i mean certainly i mean unquestionably food materials are fun because they're exciting and new but from a a useful engineering point of view. Right now, we're spending a lot of time on metals because metals in general, they're harder to print. Plastic's relatively easy to print, whereas metals, there's a lot of distortion, there's a lot of residual stress. So from a research point of view, they're more of a challenge in terms of designing the right way for, uh, you know, to print them. So we are spending probably an inordinate amount of time on researching in metal. And I've got one of my PhD students is working on, in fact, he's working on conventional manufacturing with additive manufacturing. So injection molding tooling, where you basically have a block of steel with injecting the plastic into that. He's now working on printing those in a much cheaper way and with better cooling channels. So you can actually make conventional manufactured parts but benefit from additive manufacturing to add value to the tool. So you can, you know, instead of producing 100 parts per minute, you can produce 200 parts per minute. So increase your production efficiency. But yeah, food unquestionably, it's just fun. So yeah. Yeah, no, the, the spirit of, of fun, of, of creativity, of innovation really shines through in the work you do. So if there's young people online or parents of young people, friends of young people online, or hey, it doesn't have to be young people. What, what advice would you give to people who want to learn about this space and, and get engaged with this sort of thing? Oh, I, look, I mean, I, I think first thing I was, is, yeah, I mean, come by the lab and have a look around and look at the machines and that. But you can now buy a 3D printer for, as I said, you can actually buy them for about $100. I wouldn't necessarily recommend the $100 ones. But for four or $500, you can start to get a, you know, a reasonably decent one to play with, to get experience with it. And my advice is find a problem. It doesn't matter what the problem is. Find a problem you have or somebody around you has and figure out a way of solving that problem. Probably by using 3D printing, but not necessarily. Don't get obsessed by 3D printing for the sake of 3D printing. But a really good way to get started with that innovation and creativity and coming up with new ideas is any problem that you have, any problem that a friend has or, or the world has, try to pick that and figure out a way of solving that problem in a, in a creative way. And that'll get you started down that route. Great. Well, I can see there's some great questions uh, coming in from the audience and I want to get through as many of those as we can. So I know the guitars have obviously piqued people's interest. The, the ideas that are embodied in those guitars are, are fascinating. Uh, so we've had some upvotes on uh, what did it cost to print the Rosen barbed wire guitar? <laughs> okay, the, the aluminium guitar, a lot. <laughs> so the, um, the, the, the cost the, to the, print the body would have been roughly in euro, would have been about two and a half thousand euro. Right. So bloody expensive. Um, having said that, you know, uh, uh, guitars is a funny world where if you buy a custom made brand guitar, whether it's a Gibson, whether it's a Fender, doesn't really matter. You know, they start at, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars. And I was at NAMM a few years ago and I saw a Fender Telecaster for two hundred thousand dollars and somebody actually bought it. So, yeah, uh, they are expensive unquestionably. So most of my guitars, the nylon bodies, which most of them are made out, they cost between six hundred to nine hundred euro to print. Mm -hmm. Printing today is an expensive technology and you only use it for added value products. So guitars are added value products where I think you can, you know, if you collect guitars, you can never have too many guitars and the price of the guitars is, <laughs> I've got to be careful what I say here, but it's less important. So, and of course, if you're spending, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars on the body, all the hardware, the neck, the pickups, the bridge has to be top quality stuff because you don't want to put a hundred dollar crap on, on a nine hundred dollar body. It's just not worth it. So again, I mean, just the hardware for a guitar is about another thousand and a bit dollars for quality stuff. So, you know, I sell the guitars. I don't make a huge amount of profit on them, but I, I do it as a hobby. And I, it's sort of the therapy of combining the high tech and the old tech and, and using my hands to make something. So it sounds like great therapy. We, we all need something. <laughs> So somebody else has asked, is there a place for New Zealand in the upstream supply chain, whether that's additives for 3D printed food products, whether it's manufacture and supply of printers themselves? Just curious on your thoughts on that one. 
Absolutely. I mean, I think one of the huge growing markets over in the, call it in the next 10, 15 years is actually probably more on the materials for 3D printing side than on the 3D printers themselves. So yes, absolutely. If you have a great idea for a 3D printer and on a Callahan innovation, for example, I've done one called the Micromaker, which is prints on a you know, really, really micro scale. But I think where the big growth is in the next few years is materials. And New Zealand has a huge amount of waste material. So all the waste from the forestry industry, the cellulose, the lignin, the fish market, you know, for, for, for making collagen and so on. So if we can find a way of transforming those into high value materials that we sell to the rest of the world, that is huge value. And just to give you probably a bad example, but titanium is an example. I think about 30% of the world's titanium is mined in South Africa. They ship it offshore for post-processing, for turning into usable titanium, that's the ore. They then buy it back at a thousand times the price. Then when they machine a part, they have a block of titanium for an aircraft part, they'll typically machine away about 80 to 90% of the part and they bury the leftover because it's too expensive to re-recycle. So you think about the added value. So what New Zealand does right now, we're selling the equivalent of titanium ore. You know, we're selling logs or, or things like that rather than adding value to them to get into that higher level of product that can really add value to New Zealand in a big way. And I think, I mean, yeah, waste product. And Rosalind, you mentioned that. I mean, waste product, if we can find a way of converting that into high value product, I think that's where a big part of New Zealand's future is. Yeah, no, fascinating comments about uh, titanium. <laughs> Yeah, and look, I mean, New Zealand produces minerals as well. So the same thing applies. I mean, aluminium, where we've got the smelting plant down in South Auckland, you know, again, can we take that aluminium and turn it into something that, you know, is a lot more valuable than the raw material itself? And I think, yes, we can. And additive is just one of the ways to do that. It's not the only way. There's a hundred other ways, but we need to be thinking about how we add value to what we're doing rather than making the low end, the, 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 the low hanging fruit. Indeed. Now, uh, there's another really interesting question sitting at right the top of the Q&A at the moment. Is there a concern that this technology can be used for making weapons in a way that's unregulated and illegal? Look, I, I mean, unquestionably, yes. I mean, this is probably going back about 10, 12 years. There was an American ar anarchist called Cody, Cody Wilson who printed the first gun uh, in plastic called the Liberator. Um, and he, there's a YouTube clip on, a, on, a, on firing it. And the, the next day, the FBI banned it and closed it down. So, of course, everybody wanted it even more. Um, now, the Australians tested that gun, and I think eight out of 10 of them exploded. So, yeah, I mean, think of it as, you know, the, the Darwin Awards, I, I guess, of sorts. So, yes, unquestionably, you can print a weapon, but there's just so much better ways of making a gun that's a lot heavier. You can go to Bunnings and buy a bit of pipe and use the fingers from a rubber glove to make a zip gun. Now, I don't recommend doing that. It's highly dangerous to do this. But the point is, there's much better safe ways of making weaponry than using a 3D printer for the sake of using a 3D printer. So anything is a risk towards people making things that are illegal. Is it a big risk? No. And I remember probably about 10 years ago, somebody from the government called me up saying, you know, is there a risk of people starting to 3D print drugs? Well, well, I mean, you know, in the 70s, they were printing LSD onto paper. I mean, that's about as close as you get to 3D printing as you can think about. Is there any value added by 3D printing a drug? No. Short answer, there isn't. You know, unless you want your crack to act, act extra quick on you, there's no real value added. So why would you do it? So again, you've got to be thinking about, does it actually do something that conventional manufacturing, pressing it into a pill, wouldn't do? And the same with weapons and illegal stuff. Just think about whether you're doing something really that changes life in a major way. Great, yeah. Now, I, I really want to pose another question that's sitting at the top of the Q&A at the moment about what is being done to make this technology accessible to economically challenged communities? So we're starting to see, I'm certainly desktop printers. So desktop printers are those printers that cost between call it the 500 to $3,000 range. Those are, <laughs> already accessible and there's a lot of work. So we did some work in Brazil, for example, in the favelas of Brazil, where, so in the favelas, which are the ghettos of Brazil, they have central collection spots where all the, the, the disadvantaged people go and collect waste plastic and then they bring it to the central depot and sell it for nothing. You know, they get really nothing out of it. So the concept was to put 3D printers into this central communal area that they can then take this recycled plastic, uh, you know, 
mulch it up, sh shred it, turn it into printable material that they can print added value products that they can sell and get better value of. Now, is that a solution? Not necessarily. I know around the world, lots of libraries are now starting to 3D printers in library, which makes it accessible to a wider community. Um, uh, South Africa did, did something called the I Idea to Product Lab, which is aimed specifically at the townships in South Africa, where it's labs, a bit like our lab at the university, which is open access, which means anybody can go to it. But they've also done a mobile Idea to Product Lab, which is a van with 3D printers and computers with easy to use CAD that they go around the townships in and teach disadvantaged people a how to learn to design things in CAD and then um, you know print them and how to take advantage of the, of the technologies so maybe we need something similar to that in New Zealand yeah no it sounds like an amazing amazing idea it would be fantastic uh, but yeah there are there are definitely options in community libraries in New Zealand um, for sure and as Olaf says his lab genuinely is a, a very open open place as well. Now, someone else has asked you, is there a 3D printer on the International Space Station? Uh, yes, in fact, there is. So it's an extrusion-based machine. So it's a hot glue gun-based machine. And they've used it for, they've printed spanners. They've printed all sorts of crazy things on it. But apparently, one of the most valuable things they've actually printed on it was a back scratcher. Strangely enough, because apparently when you're wearing this space gear, so they literally they printed a back scratcher. There's lots of regulations on the space station what, about what you can and cannot bring with you. So, for example, you're not allowed to use things like forks because they're dangerous and if they float, you know, you could poke yourself in the eye with them. So they use sporks instead. So there's and a back scratcher was one of the things they couldn't take with them. So they printed one with them. But the big thing was tools, replacement tools. So if you lose a tool and it floats away in zero gravity behind a cabinet, um, they used a 3D printer to replace it. And there was a competition in the United States to design tools for printing on the space station. And the big push now is getting metal printing on the space station. And they're working on it now. So right now there are extrusion-based metal systems, but the big one of interest is powder. But of course, powder-based metal in a zero gravity environment, you can start to see all the engineering challenge behind that. But they are working on it. So it will happen definitely before too long. Oh, great, great stuff. Um, got another question come in. Can flexible materials be used in 3D printing? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there are now elastomeric, so rubber materials. I'm holding one up here, which you can hopefully see. So that goes from soft rubber up to hard plastic. It's called digital materials. We're using base materials, you know, soft rubber materials, and you can combine them in new ways with solid materials. So yes, you can. I would have to say today, they're relatively core in terms of strength, particularly on a tension, they tear very easily. There are now also powdered rubber materials, so TPUs and TPEs, so thermoplastic urethanes that are available to print soft rubber parts. So yes, absolutely they are. So if you're doing things like gaskets, perfect, no problem at all. If you're doing things like that are under tension that might tear, not so much yet, but the new powdered materials may well so uh, solve that problem. Awesome. Uh, we've still got time for a few more questions. So I'm interested in the question at the top of the Q&A at the moment on good design versus bad design. So yep. in terms of do you envisage a correctly constructed building being 3D printed and how would that speed up build times and reduce costs? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the question between good and bad design is a really good one. So with, with conventional manufacturing, so let's say we're looking at injection molding, the difference between a well-designed and a badly designed and a well-manufactured and a badly manufactured part is about a threefold price increase. So a well-designed part compared to a badly designed part is about three times cheaper. Additive manufacturing is probably tenfold. So a badly designed additive manufacturing part compared to a badly designed, three, uh, uh, a well-designed 3D printed part is probably a 10 times price increase. But if the question referred to building, so right now there's a huge amount of effort around the world in construction. So 3D printing entire buildings. And yes, there are already many buildings around the world that have been printed. Probably the leaders in that area are China with a company called Winsun, who have printed entire apartment buildings, lots of houses, bus shelters, public toilets. So effectively they're using extrusion techniques. So it's effectively like icing a cake, but instead of with icing, you're, you're squeezing out concrete and you're drawing the lines of the building, building up layer by layer. Um, it exists today. Um, you still have a lot of problems with, you still need rebar in the buildings and pump concrete in the them up. So it's far from being perfect yet. 
And probably my personal biggest complaint with it is to date, almost all the buildings that have been 3D printed have been really boring square buildings with flat walls that you could precast much more efficiently. So I think what we need is we need the architects to get involved to design buildings that have got funky shapes that you couldn't do by casting. There's a, a hotel villa in the Philippines that has been done like that. And it's one of the few that I've seen that you wouldn't be able to, to cast. So yeah, I mean, it is a growing area and we're working on, so we've just now ordered a robot arm that we will be turning into a, it's going to be a three type of print. It's going to print in concrete, print in carbon fiber, so composites, and print large scale fast plastic. So the concrete side will be doing small scale architectural work um, for the construction industry. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to take the next question. Uh, we've been asked, is 3D printing taught in schools? Um, so right now, I mean, around the world, um, in most, call it science and technology classes, there's a small component of 3D printing. Um, in New Zealand, actually, I've only been back in New Zealand for a year and a half. I'm not entirely sure whether, so I actually need to find out whether it's being taught as part of the curricula here in New Zealand. But in my opinion, it certainly should be. But probably more important from an educational point of view is teaching the computer-aided design skills. Because that is one, you, know, you cannot print without a computer model, so you need to learn those computer skills. And as an engineer, as a scientist, as a designer, your prime form of communication with the world, with other engineers, is today through computer-aided design. So to me, that's the key. To you know, if you teach that well at school, then they know it when they get to university or to Polytech or whatever it is. Um, then you've got students that are set up for a winning streak all the way home. Yeah, I mean, in my experience working with New Zealand schools and teachers, there definitely is some exposure to 3D printing in some schools, but my take on it is that it is probably still very patchy. Uh, but I do tend to agree with Olaf in terms of schools needing to build up some of the underlying computer-based design skills to prepare students to learn it uh, later. Uh, we can grab uh, one or two more questions. Uh, so we've been asked, do we see a reduction in post-processing time in the future? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's sort of one of our prime areas of research focus. So we try, so almost all the parts we design within the lab that are our parts designed by us have almost no post-processing. So we design them so none of our parts get heat treated because we design them so there's no residual stress in the parts so they don't need to be heat treated. And again, support material, we design them in a way where you cut them off the plate and you're done. No other post-processing needed. Of course, when we get parts from the general public from companies, we do still have some post-processing there. So one of our goals is to teach those companies how to design the right way to minimize that post-processing, to make it as painless as possible if it's at all possible to do. Painless sounds good. Uh, so your, your lab is obviously very, very dear to you. Uh, somebody's open asked, is it open in level two or level one COVID alert? So um, short answer, yes, we have been open. So back to normal from level two. In level three and four, we were going there to print parts and working from home. Now, what that means in terms of visitors coming to the university, I don't know. Rosalind, do you know anything more about that in terms of general public thing? Visit is probably easier um, under level one, but definitely not impossible at level two, but okay. most of the university are still working from home at the moment. But, I mean, level one, I, I see no problem visiting there. I, I, my suggestion would be level two, if you can do it as groups, then it's easier, then we can make, we can figure out how to get special permission to bring groups in, or, or if you've got people from your company, you got five or 10 people who want to come through, just let us know and we'll set it up, we'll, we'll make it happen. Yeah, and there's been a number of people asking online, uh, is the material going to be shared? So uh, the recording of the session will go up on the Raising the Bar website, uh, and there's already a link been shared to that in the answered section of the Q&A. And maybe our last question, uh, quite an insightful one, how do you keep the printer clean? <laughs> Look, I mean, Unquestioned, I mean, in printing, cleanliness is next to holiness. You've got to keep the printer clean. The biggest reason for print failing is because it's not clean. 
And then the question is, what do you do with the waste material? Now, some waste materials, and probably the one of biggest concern is the, the resin-based materials, where often the support material is a water-soluble wax of some sort. That is the biggest one in terms of getting rid of that waste material, because it does contain microspheres of plastic, which you don't really want getting to the environment. But there are standard precautions for all material so metal powder if you have any waste generally with metal there's little waste because we recycle all the powder sieve it and reuse it but the waste material we normally passivate it with oil and sand before disposing it through the standard chemical procedures for that um so yeah it, it's nothing difficult but basic standard safety precautions you have to take to make sure things don't get back out into the environment to keep things safe fantastic yeah stuff stuff i had never thought about uh, so I think I will bring it to a close in terms of Q&A there, and I would like to extend everybody's thanks to Olaf for a really fascinating insight into the world of additive manufacturing. I love the, the creativity and the innovation that it represents. When I first saw the draft of Olaf's slides, I did have no idea it was going to mention zombie movies at this hour of the morning in New Zealand, and I won't be looking at my iPad in quite the same way now, but I'm sure everyone would agree with me that it was a very enjoyable talk that uh, everyone took a lot away from. So Raising the Bar Home Edition is a series of six speakers over six weeks. Olaf was our third speaker in the series, so three talks remain. We do hope that you'll be able to join us again at one of the other talks. To do that, there's a confirmation uh, email that has a link uh, that will take you to the Raising the Bar website. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.